I'm so thankful for the godly women in my life, and I hope you are as well, and hope you have some godly women in your life. Thankful for my mother. What a godly, godly lady my mother is. And uh, I remember growing up, I'd walk into her room, and she'd be on the floor in the bedroom reading the Bible, and she'd be praying, and there'd be tears coming down her face. I'm sure it was tears for me and, uh, and her prayer, but a godly woman. Uh, my grandfather's wife, Anita, was a god, is a godly, godly lady. Appreciate Anita so much in my life. And then my wife, Doreen, is a godly woman. I'm so thankful, I'm thankful for godly women. It being Mother's Day, of course, there's a few things that we have to do to honor mothers. And one is uh, re to be reminded of some things that our mothers have taught us. Right? They taught us some wonderful things. Washing our hands and, you know, how to have good table manners. I remember the meals, we'd sit around the table and my mother would instruct us and which fork to use and where to put your left arm, where to put your right arm and how to pass the dishes in the proper manner and not reach and have good manners or good things. But there's some other things that mothers have taught us that I think are even worth mentioning even in a greater way. Like this, my mother, my mother taught me about religion. Did your mother teach you about religion? You better pray that will come out of the carpet. My mother taught me about logic. I'm glad mothers teach about logic because I said so. That's why. My mother taught me science. Osmosis. Shut your mouth and eat your supper. My mother taught me about stamina. You better sit there. You'll sit there until all that spinach is finished. My mother taught me about the circle of life. I brought you into this world, I can take you out. <laughs> and my mother taught me about envy. Did your mother? There are millions of less fortunate children in the world who don't have wonderful mother, a wonderful mother like you have right there. Wonderful things our mothers have taught us. I'm so thankful, like I mentioned, for the godly women that God has put in my life. I'm so thankful for a church. Look, look around, and I can see that uh, in this church there are wonderful ladies that I have been blessed by, that I have been challenged by, by their faith, by their walk with God. I am so thankful for the godly women in my life. You see, society says a woman's value is determined by how she looks. And if she fits a certain mold, then she is worth more money and more valuable Yet the Bible teaches us, Scripture teaches us that a woman's value is in who she is or her character. Who she loves, who she devoted to, her God, her family. Society and Scripture do not line up on this issue of a godly woman. And I'm so thankful in Proverbs chapter 31 that we have the description of a godly woman. Written in chapter, Proverbs chapter 31 by a king in verse number 1 by the name of Lemuel. There is some discrepancy about who this king may be. They cannot find any record of this king in any writings. It could be a king of Massa, as some people say, but others and more so believe it's probably Solomon. He wrote most of Proverbs, and, and uh, we know, uh, and throughout the book of Proverbs he wrote, and so it would make sense that he would write this one. I like that idea that it's Solomon. In fact, the early, the early rabbis believed it to be Solomon as well. He had a number of different names he would go by. I love that fact because his mother, as he talks about, uh, he's, her teaching to him, his mother, if you remember the story, was Bathsheba, who didn't have a great beginning, but apparently had a great ending. And I'm glad that a godly woman is not the same as a perfect woman. Or because we know that's not possible. Not to offend you, ladies, it's not possible. And sometimes you ladies may read Proverbs 31 and say, I could never measure up. I could never reach that height of, of Proverbs 31. Yet I believe in the description that we have so many women who reach that height, who love God and love their family, love their commitments. If you would look at me, please, in beginning in verse number 10 of Proverbs 31, where the king says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her ma maidens. She considereth a field. 
and by it with the fruit of her hands she planted the vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good, her candle goeth not out by night. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry, her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. She maketh fine linen and selleth it, and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is a law of kindness. She looketh well to the ways of her household, and eateth not the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praiseth her. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful, and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Lord, thank you for this time we have. Lord, thank you for working out some of the technical difficulties. Lord, thank you for the godly women that I am privileged to have in my life, Lord, and to know. Lord, I pray you'd help us this time as we look at this passage, that you'd help our eyes to be open, our hearts to be touched. And Lord, I pray that there's someone under the sound of my voice this morning who does not know uh, that, that they have a home in heaven, they've never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, that today, on May the 10th, this Mother's Day, they would trust you and trust Jesus as their Savior. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. This description of a, of a godly woman, it is a long description, right? It is a, it is a hard description. You start to read in, in verses 10 through 30, and you begin to see what this lady, as she described, what she does. I think the better question is not what she does, but the better question is, what doesn't she do? She buys fields and she sells fields. She goes afar to find the good price on food and good food. She makes wonderful scarlet clothes for her family and herself. She's in tapestry and purple and silk. Her candle goes not out by night. Some believe that that means she works all night. Others means that she always has some business dealings across the whole globe. She, she can't find the idleness in her hands. All right, She's always working, and her husband gets to stand in the, in the gate of the city and be honored by his wife, who's working so hard. And the godly woman. But I think there's three keys of this characteristic of a godly woman. Three attributes or three descriptions this morning. The first description I would say is this, that she is priceless. She's priceless. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? She's priceless. You might, you might remember those old commercials with a MasterCard, and they'd say, well, you can do this, you know, and this is priceless, but for the rest, there's MasterCard. Unfortunately, you can't buy, you can't buy a godly woman. You can't buy a virtuous woman. It used to be a time when you could, uh, they'd make the, t the joke about a mail-order bride, all right? And perhaps at that time you could possibly buy a bride, but you can't buy a virtuous woman. You can't buy, she is, she is priceless. I have a question this morning. What do bulletproof vests, circular saws, and windshield wipers all have in common? Bulletproof vests, circular saws, and windshield wipers, all very manly items, Bulletproof vests, right? Police officers put them on, man. And, 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 and circular saws, every man needs two, one for each hand. You can cut twice as fast. And windshield wipers. Each of these items have left a significant mark on culture, and all three were invented by a lady, by a woman. You see, this priceless woman, there is trust involved. That's what the Bible says. The heart of the, her husband does safely trust in her. There's trust, so there's no need to worry. This lady, she's trustworthy. He doesn't have to worry about what she's doing with her time. She's obviously making good use of her time. I don't have to worry if she's being faithful. She obviously is. The heart of her husband does safely trust in her. He doesn't worry about where she's spending the money because she's spending it in a wise and wonderful fashion. I've worked with some couples over the years, and sometimes there's been financial discrepancies between the husband and the wife. Sometimes it's the husband that's the spender, and sometimes it's the wife that's the spender. It's kind of an equal opportunity offender for the people that I've been able to help along the way. And uh, I don't know what it'd be like, because uh, my wife's not this way, to have, a, to have a wife, have a lady in my life who just spent money without any regard for anything else happening. I could see how that could be a problem. I don't have that. I'm thankful for that. I have trust in her. 
I trust when she goes to the grocery store, she brings back things that are good for the family. And if she buys herself something, I'm fine with that. She knows our finances. I have trust in her. I don't worry about what she's doing when she's cooking. So far, she's not burned the house down yet. That's a good thing. We burned about the same amount of meals, all right? And that's okay. We all mess up on a meal once in a while. And in case you're wondering, I did make crepes this morning for my wife. I made the batter last night. I got already stuck in the fridge, and she asked if I wanted help with it. I said, no, ma'am. No, no, no. This is Mother's Day. And so they turned out okay. You know, I even took a picture of it so that I had some a memento of what I did with, with the crepes this morning. They seemed to enjoy them. But I don't worry about my wife cooking. She does a wonderful job around the house and keeping the house so nice. But beyond that, she's wonderful with the children. There is trust there. This lady is priceless because there is trust, and this trust is priceless. I don't worry when she's driving down what she's going to tell my kids. My wife is a teacher at heart. That means anything my kids ask, she has a nice long explanation. Why is the sky blue can be a 20-minute conversation. And the kids know why it's blue. Tadpoles and frogs and all that. Uh, my wife loves to hunt and find things. In fact, we'll go to the beach and she'll disappear for a couple of hours. And she will come back with the, with the strangest animals that she has found that I would never see. I mean, there was one time there was a story told about my wife that when she was in college, she caught, uh, she caught a fish. About what? About 24 inches? She's about 24 inches long. She caught with her bare hands. With her bare hands. Right? That's a, that, that's a Proverbs 31 woman. Who needs fishing poles when you have my wife, all right? Just throw her in the lake and she'll come up with supper. It's tremendous. There's trust there. No need to worry. It's also treasure there. No need for anything else. That's what the verse says in, in, in uh, verse number 10, or verse number 11. So that he shall have no need of spoil. Of course, the idea that when you went to war, you'd bring back the spoils, you'd bring back more treasure. And yet, this, this passage tells us, this verse tells us, that with a virtuous woman, with this godly woman, there is no need for anything else. I don't need a big treasure to bring home because I have everything I need in this wonderful lady. There's a treasure there. You see, it's sadly common for people to undervalue something that is in all actuality quite valuable. It is common to undervalue something that is priceless. I imagine that many of, many of us have done that to our parents, to other godly women in our life. There's an account of a rare Chinese bowl that was bought from a garage sale for $3. The bowl was found in New York State, and so a, a couple had found it, and they liked it. It was about a five-inch bowl, they said, and they kept it in their house for a couple of years, and then they were a little curious, they were a little curious about the, about the history of this little bowl. Come to find out, they had stumbled for $3 upon a thousand-year-old treasure, and it was valued at two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars but it sold for two point two million dollars at auction wow what a treasure you've seen maybe those shows on tv where they bring those things from their house and and the person there the curator perhaps looks at that thing and says wow that's a lot of money or wow that's a piece of junk I'm here to tell you that whether you value her or not, a godly woman is priceless. Is priceless. It's common for us to undervalue something that is in actuality quite valuable. A godly woman is price, priceless, but number two, a godly woman is profitable. The majority of this chapter is spent on what she does. Like I mentioned, it's not so much what she does, but it's what she doesn't do. She labors tireless, tirelessly up and down, back and forth. She's prepared. A godly woman is prepared. I read this little story that a man announced to his wife at breakfast that he was going to ask his employer for a raise. He said, I am grossly underpaid, and I think today is the day I'm going to ask for a raise. So he promptly went off to work and asked his, his, his boss for a raise. That night he came home with the good news that he had indeed not only asked for, but gotten a raise. In the meantime, his wife had prepared a festive dinner filled with candles and flowers and cloth napkins. The whole works. Beside his plate was a note that said, Darling, I knew you'd get the raise. I'm so proud of you. This meal will hopefully tell you how much I love you. 
Well, he enjoyed the dinner, and then because she cooked so much he, and, and did such a wonderful job, he decided to clear the table. As he was clearing the table, the story goes, he found a second note under his wife's plate. And this note said, Darling, I know you're disappointed. You and I both know you deserve that raise, but it doesn't matter. I love you, and I hope this special dinner will tell you that. The lady was prepared. A good woman. She was ready for whatever news her husband came home with. If he hadn't cleared the table, he never would have known. I, I know that a, a godly woman in this chapter, she labors tirelessly. I think back to growing up in my house with six other brothers and sisters, seven of us kids, and all the time that my mother spent. I see now during this, this pandemic where my wife is helping our kids study at home at the same time teaching her class at Sherwood Elementary. She labors tirelessly. And she does it with such a sweet and wonderful spirit. She always seems to be prepared. Supper is always there. My clothes still magically appear in the drawer. It's an amazing thing. I live in a magical house. See, this woman, she's profitable. Labors tirelessly and loves selflessly. In fact, I only see one little verse that talks about herself where it says she is clothed in purple and silk or tra and, and, and tapestry. Everything else seems to be done for everyone else. And that is one of the marks of a virtuous woman who they love selflessly. A mother who's willing to give the last bite of cake to her child, to stay up late, to hold a hurt child, to wait late for the husband. You see, this godly woman has no thought for her own gain. She has thought for what he is, she has been called to be. There's a wonderful lady in my life who has dedicated her life for a ministry single lady, and she has been there, I think, I want to say almost 60 years, 55 or 60 years, with no thought for herself, but for the work of the Lord. That's a virtuous woman, loves selflessly. The lady I read about, Vashti Rosdell of St. Paul, Minnesota. She's a mother of four grown kids herself, but in 1948, she accepted her first two foster children. And over the years, she had foster child after foster child after foster child in her house. So that at the end, when she finally had to stop, she had over 162 foster children in her home. Now they are going on to do many things. There are some with special needs and, and some uh, others. And yet over and over, child after child, this later Vashti, she loved selflessly. A virtuous woman loves selflessly. And then she looks endlessly. Verse number 16. She looks endlessly to enrich her family, to enrich her husband, to enrich her commitments. You see, this virtual woman, she, this virtuous woman, she is priceless, she is profitable. But lastly, she is praiseable. Verse number 30, where the Bible says, Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. What's interesting is that, though the majority of this chapter is on what she does, at the end of the chapter, that's not what she is praised for. Though she is commended along the way for, for how she lived, what she is praised for is for her devotion to her God. She does a lot, but she's praised for devoted to God. She does a lot, but she is praised for her greatest attribute, and that is for her fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord, the highest quality in a godly woman. Fear of the Lord, a, a love for God, a devotion to God, a desire to obey God. You see, ladies, you may look at this list and say, boy, I could never buy a field. I could never get some ships, merchant ships. I could never even make clothes. But to be praised, you don't have to do those things. You fear God, you can be praised. The woman that feared the Lord, she shall be praised. There is freedom in worship of God. Someone said it this way, in order to be free, in order to be free to sail the seven seas, we must make ourselves a slave to the compass. When we have bondage to the compass, we are free to sail the seven seas. And when we have bondage to Christ, we have freedom to sail in life. You see, there is bondage outside of Christ. 
The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God because of my sin, because of your sin, and we're all sinners. It makes us ineligible for heaven. We've come short of the glory of God. God is a holy God. He can't allow sin into heaven. Because of my sin, because of your sin, we don't deserve and can't go to heaven. For the wages of sin is death. Some people want to say, well, you can pay for sin if you're really good and one day when I die, I'll, I'll stand before God and He'll weigh my good and my bad. The Bible doesn't teach us that our deeds will be weighed good and bad in order to go to heaven. The Bible says for the wages of sin, the payment for sin is death. Others may say, well, Pastor, I got baptized, so I'm going to heaven, but the Bible doesn't say the wages of sin is baptism. And yet others, well, Pastor, I'm a member of this church, so I'm going to heaven, and the Bible doesn't say for the wages of sin, the payment for sin is to be a member of a church. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. The Bible tells us that God commendeth, he showed his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And while the wages of sin is death, the payment for sin is death, Jesus paid the price for our sin. Jesus lived a perfect life on earth, never sinned a single time. Then he went to the cross, and he died on the cross. He died on the cross not to pay for his sin. He was sinless, but to pay for your sin and for my sin. Because he was sinless and holy, he could pay for someone else's sin. And because he is the Son of God, he could pay for everyone's sin. The Bible says, and he is the propitiation for our sin, the payment, the substitution for our sin, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And while I'm a sinner and you're a sinner, and I don't deserve to go to heaven, I deserve to pay for my sin and be separated from God, Jesus paid the price for my sin. And by trusting in Him and His payment, then I receive God's gift, which is eternal life, life in heaven, only through Jesus Christ our Lord. You can trust Jesus Christ today. You can ask him to save you. The Bible says that the greatest attribute of this woman is her fear of the Lord. Not in her work, not in her labor, not in her love, but in her devotion to God. And ladies, this morning, you may think, well, I could never live up to that standard of Proverbs chapter 31. But you can fear God. And if you have a godly woman in your life, don't forget to say thank you. Don't forget to honor them. I believe it was Anna Jarvis who brought about the national holiday known as Mother's Day. She tried for years to have this holiday be declared, and I believe it was Woodrow Wilson who finally declared this to be a national holiday, Mother's Day. Yet she fought to maintain her intellectual rights to this day, and she was disappointed that it had been commercialized. Oh, if only she could see it now. About two years ago, they said on, on average on Mother's Day, they'd spend $189 million on Mother's Day in the U.S. Or around, they said, this is what the article I found, $189 per mother. So ladies, if you haven't got 100, almost $190, almost $200, you may be shortchanged this Mother's Day. Don't forget to say thank you. Ladies, understand that your greatest gift to your family, to your friends, to your co-workers, to your parents, to everyone around you, is not what you do, though that is commendable. No, it's not how you love, though that is wonderful and priceless. It is whom you're devoted to, your God. And you can be devoted to God and give that gift of devotion to God, the fear of the Lord, to your family, friends, co-workers, and parents.